Heavenly Father, we come to you once more on this Sabbath day, thankful that uh, despite the cold weather outside and the snow, you keep us warm inside. And, and despite the winter that we're experiencing, it reminds us that though our sins may be scarlet, uh, they will be as white as snow. May we remind ourselves as we see this, uh, things happening in nature of your grace and goodness and kindness to us. As we open the preview of our lesson for next week, that of discipleship and the outcast, may we learn to be as gracious as Jesus was when he was on earth, extending, understanding, love and compassion to those who are disenfranchised, particularly those who are not accepted even within our fellowship. Teach us to be more considerate and show your love and share your grace to such people as they are. Guide us with your spirit, make us teachable, make us uh, responsive to the truth that you want us to know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last week we studied about the ordinary. And when we study about the ordinary, we talk about people who are not known. Okay, if we go to 1 Corinthians 1, uh, not many of you were known based on worldly standards. Not many of you were wise. But the Lord has turned the foolishness of this world into wisdom in Jesus Christ. You read that, okay? So we, we, we studied that you must have respect for the ordinary. I, I was reading a book and I've been posting it in Facebook that in fact we are so obsessed with the spectacular today that when you don't see the spectacular you think God is not around. Yeah, there's a lot of excitement today. You've been in church, we've been to a worship service, we listened to a very gripping sermon, you had a, a Sabbath school lesson study, we will have an AY by and by, we'll have a church board meeting. These are things that are happening. That's kind of fantastic, very visible. That's come Monday, you go back to work. And that's the ordinary day-to-day -day things that you need to do. Uh, was God just in Sabbath school today or in the Sabbath in church? Or is God still there? When you go to work, is God there while you're driving your car? The whole, I, the whole study this morning was that God is everywhere. In fact, if you don't have God, one author said, ruling your mundane. In other words, if God is not in the ordinary stuff that you do in life, He's not with you at all. <laughs> I mean, not that God is not with you, but He's saying, if you do not surrender to God in the small things, you cannot surrender to Him in the bigger things. So you got to understand that God is in the ordinary. Now, from the ordinary, our author, the author of the quarterly, switches from the ordinary to the outcasts. This is not just ordinary. These are people, the rejects, the people who don't find acceptance in the church and in the fellowship. How, how do we, as disciples of the gospel of Christ, treat those who are disenfranchised, those who are outcast, those who are rejected by many people. Okay, that's the whole idea. So we go to Luke 15. And everybody knows what Luke 15 is all about, right? What is Luke 15? It's about three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. And you've heard so many You've heard so many sermons about this. One particular sermon I heard, which I cannot forget, is uh, he said, this is a parable of three target audiences for evangelism. Okay? The first target is like when you're talking about the lost coin, you're talking about the people who are lost and they do not know that they are lost. Because the coin is lost, but the coin didn't know that it's lost. Okay? The next is the lost sheep. This talk about people who are lost but can't find the way back. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, they have, it, we can talk about addicts and codependents. You know, they want, they want to straighten out their ways, but there's just no way. So somebody's got to help them out. Talk about the paralytic last week, right? They lowered them from the. Uh, and then the third is about the lost son who knew he was lost. But he had the wherewithal to come back. That's really nice. You know, you did, we'll talk about uh, the evangelistic implications of Luke 15. But if you read Luke 15 in its context, it's really got nothing to do with evangelism. The main thrust is not evangelism. 
What did Jesus say in Luke 14? Remember context, it's context, okay? A text without the context is pretext. What was going on in Luke 14? Luke 14 is saying, if you want to follow me, what do you need to do? What did Jesus say? Uh, somebody read verses 25 and 26 of Luke 14. Okay, and then Rufo comes with uh, what he just said. Uh, verse 27, somebody read it. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There you go, cross bearing. In other words, if you want to be Christ's disciple, you have to abandon all. You're going to just abandon part of what you have. You want to be a disciple? Jesus said, there's no way you can follow me and become my disciple unless you forsake everything. So right before he tells the story of these lost parables, parables of this lost coin, lost sheep, and lost son, he was making a radical call to discipleship. And that discipleship demanded the abandonment, the relinquishment of everything that you have. In fact, it's saying, you look at the, look at the, the word picture that uh, Jesus uses here. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation, it's not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. In other words, if, before you do something, a project, make sure that it will be completed. What is Jesus trying to say? Discipleship is no joke. You want to follow me? Look and evaluate. Is it worth following me? And of course, it's going to be worth following him, right? You got to understand who Jesus is. The moment you understand Jesus and who it is asking you to follow him as a disciple, you will not help yourself but forsake everything to follow him. That's what Jesus is trying to say. So he's talking about being a disciple and forsaking everything to follow him. And all of a sudden... He talks about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Okay? Let's put it in context. So we jump to chapter 15. And somebody read verses 1 to 3 of chapter 15. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners draw near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of... Okay, that's it. Okay, before we go to the parable. Okay, that, that's okay. Thanks. Okay, so what is the introduction to the parable? Why did he tell the story? What triggered the stories? Cleo, do you see it? Okay. The tax collectors and the sinners, the prostitutes, all these outcasts were flocking around Jesus Christ. And how did the Pharisees react? Okay, did you get it? Why did he speak the parable? Why did he relate those stories? Because the Pharisees said he was eating with sinners. He was eating with tax collectors. He was eating with the outcasts. Remember, why did the Jews hate the guts of the tax collectors during their time? If you were a tax collector, who do you work for? You work for the Roman government. And the Roman government was the colonizer of Palestine, of the Jews. If you were alive during the Japanese occupation, when the Japanese occupied the Philippines, one of the hated Filipinos are those who work for the Japanese government, right? Because you know how oppressive the Japanese regime was. And for you to work for the Japanese and you're a Filipino, that's treason. So the Jews were looking at the tax collectors who served the Roman government toward the colonizer of the Jews as traitors. They hated them. They don't even want to come. Why will they even, you know, that's, I told you about that, right? Uh, uh, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans really don't go along really well. <laughs> Not because they speak the same language. They, they, they practically, them comes from the same race. The only difference is that Puerto Rico is a product protectorate of the United States. So they, they kind of sold the national soul of Puerto Rico to America. 
you know, what would, what would you say if somebody, if Noynoy no, no, Aquino, Pinoy Aquino said, let's make the Philippines a state of the United States. Everybody says, cool. <laughs> Alleviate some of the poverty. But if you're a true-blooded Filipino, what? My grandfather and my great-grandfather spilled their blood to defend the freedom of this country and you want to sell the national soul? You're going to hate your gods. That's the way they treated the tax collectors. But more than that, there's a lot of prostitutes. The rejects who cannot go to the temple who follows Christ. And you got lepers who you cannot touch. I mean, you got the sick following Jesus. Um, so Jesus said, since you guys are murmuring among yourselves, telling me that I'm associating and eating with outcasts, I'll tell you three stories. All right, here comes the study this afternoon. Tell me the first story. What does it say? Okay, the first is the lost sheep. The lost sheep, okay? Uh, what, what, what's, what's the... Somebody read verse 4. Okay, read the text, okay? It's very important to understand the, the background of the text. What men of you, okay, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine, and they will the rest go after. What does Christ assume in his question? Yeah, the, the assumption of Jesus Christ the assumption of Jesus Christ basically here, this is a rhetorical question. This is not a question meant to be answered. He's saying, it is understood that if you have 100 sheep, if you have 100 sheep and one gets lost, you know what you do? You leave the 99 and look for the other sheep. Because even you Pharisees, if you have 100 sheep, if you lose one sheep, well, you know what happens? You leave the 99 and look for the one sheep. Okay, That's what the text is saying. There's nothing to do with evangelizing somebody that's lost as a sheep. Jesus is basically saying, you know, you guys, you're so concerned about, you know, you lose one sheep. You forget the 99 because you don't want to lose something, you know. You want, you want to get that something that's lost. And you will leave everything. And worse, what happens? When you find the sheep, what happens? You celebrate. How do you celebrate? You call your friends and your neighbors. And then what happens? You throw a party. How much preparations do you need? You probably end up killing five sheep, okay? <laughs> you know, you, know, you, you got to look at the humor of Jesus here. He's telling a story. He's trying to drive a point. And pe people are missing this in Luke 15. Okay, let's go to the next part. Somebody read verse uh, 8. Okay, in the lost sheep, what man is <laughs> said, not said. Now what woman? Okay, what woman? You know, and remember the way William Barclay described this. This lost coin is actually there's a headband that the uh, Jewish woman wears, and there's several coins around the headband, and some one of the coins fell, and that's why he's, she's looking for it because it will not be complete. Okay, that's what it's basically saying here. But Jesus is saying both men and women. They obsess in finding something lost because they don't want to lose anything. Okay? And what does it do? What, what happens the moment he finds the, the lost coin? He will call the neighbors, he will call the friends, and they will party. He'll probably, she'll probably spend more money than that lost coin. Okay? <laughs> he will, will go to that. And then it becomes preposterous. It's preposterous. Jesus is just trying to say, What's the, what, is the, what is the tendency of men in, in the vernacular? Ayo na agraviado. You don't want to lose anything. You, you, you want it all. You know, I mean, if I go gambling, if, if I win, I want to get all my, you know, whatever, whatever stakes I put in there. I want everything back. And nothing lost. I want to get everything. I want to grab everything. You're just grabbers. So Jesus is basically saying the first two parables. 
You know what, you guys? You are so obsessed with not losing things. You do everything to get something that's lost. You what? Even at the expense of sanity. Okay? You retrieve something that's lost and you spend more in celebrating the recovery of that thing that's lost. So the first two, the first two parables deals with something. If you want to treat the, the sheep as a thing too. It's an animal. It's, not, it's just a thing. Now the third parable is different because the third parable talks about the person. Okay, you know the story of the prodigal son, right? And the prodigal son left his dad in, in an outrageous disrespect for his dad. He claimed his possession. And let me just try to explain it. What did the dad uh, give the son? According to Jewish tradition, what the father gave the son was the capital capital of uh, his inheritance and the dad still kept the interest of the capital how, 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 how do you do that because you don't get the capital until the dad expires until the dad dies that's the, that's the tradition so he was able to give the money you know what happened you know he went to a far country spent it in riotous living and when he ran out of food he was dying of hunger he remembered his dad he repented he came back and said, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please take me as one of your servants. And you know the story. And they ended up uh, hugging each other. The prodigal son was taken back by grace. God. And then the story didn't end there. Here comes the elder brother. And the elder brother comes in. Was he glad that the younger brother's back? No, he was mad. He was raging mad. Why? He said, Man, I've worked these years for you. You even even slaughtered one goat for me. You know, you get the fatted calf, so then my my brother, who who squandered <laughs> your money in reckless living, in immoral living, what you do? What do you what do you do? You throw a party for him. It isn't fair. He was mad. He didn't even care. He didn't even call his brother brother. Yeah, this child of yours instead of my brother. That's what he's saying. That's how mad he was. Follow me carefully and then we'll go into a, a detailed understanding of what the passage is in terms of our lesson. Jesus was saying, you Pharisees, you are so concerned when you lose things and you want to do everything to recover a <coughs> lost thing. When you find that lost thing, it becomes your possession once more. You celebrate with uh, an unreasonable and illogical amount of money you need to spend in order to celebrate. But you know what? When the person gets lost and the sinner is saved, you don't care about the person. You care about things more than you care about a person. That's the message of the passage. And more than that, you don't only not care for these people, you're even mad at those people. In fact, Jesus said, you're mad at me. You're mad at me because I care for those people and you don't care. You're mad at the people and you're mad at me. So it was not a lovey doovy story, the third story. It was a rebuke to the Pharisee. Actually, if you were a Pharisee listening to Jesus while he was telling this parable, the last story was a big condemnation for you because you rejected the outcast. So you get the drift, you get the flow of the story. So let's go to the summary of what we're trying to do. I just discussed possession and person. There's a problem with the Pharisees when it comes to outcasts. Okay? The Pharisee, the self-righteous, are more concerned about possessions rather than persons. And you always find that even within the Christian church. People who are more concerned with possessions rather than their concern for persons. Pastor David Kokyong kind of touched on that this morning when he preached about obsessing for the work and forgetting the family, forgetting the people that really matters. Okay? Of course, I have a balancing view there. The balancing view there, it is also possible for you to make your kids your idols. You know what I mean? So you follow your kids, you neglect your responsibility towards God. Okay? So you got to balance that. I think it's still incumbent upon the parents to teach your kids 
to respect you, okay? Uh, when I think the story today is the reverse. A lot of fathers and mothers would like to spend time with their kids, but the kids don't want their fathers and mothers hanging around them, right? <laughs> you don't hang around with me. You know? You're an embarrassment to my friends. <laughs> that happens, you know? So you, have, you, got the balance, you have a balancing effect. But the bottom line is saying, when you're a kind of person, you, when you're a Pharisee where you value more of possession than a person, you will not know how to treat an outcast. I have an example here. There are three stories in the teacher's edition that's being used to treat the outcast. The first story is about the adulterous woman in John 8. Remember, that was dragged into Jesus. The second story is in Mark 5 about the gathering demoniacs, the guy living in the cemetery. And the third story is about the Samar Samaritan woman in John 4. Okay? So we'll try to apply this illustration into this three contrasts that we see. The first one I'd like to apply is the gathering demoniac. Okay? Demoniac in Gadara. So go to Mark 5. There was a demon-possessed man in Gadara. Where did he live? He yeah, lived in the cemetery. Lived in the tombs. Because nobody can come near him. You put him in chains. He's able to break the chains. He's strong because evil spirits have possessed him. Okay? Uh, did you see the documentary in Channel 11? That there are Filipinos who live in the cemetery. You see that? Oh, it wasn't, I, I thought I saw that in the Philippines while I, was, I was, while I was doing my workout because when we arrived in the Philippines, it was close to Todos Los Santos, which is November 1, okay, All Saints Day. And you know what happens in the Philippines when All Saints Day, right? There's no classes. Everybody goes to the tomb prior to All Saints Day. You gotta take, paint the tomb white, okay, to get ready because people gather around their loved ones and you know, they say they light their candles and say prayers. That's a Catholic tradition. So, but while I was watching the preparations of the Filipinos, at least in Metro Manila, in the Cementerio del Norte, and then in, 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 Lo, in, in La Loma, in the Pitan, they focus on kids who actually live in the cemetery. They live there, okay? Why do they live in the cemetery? They have no other place to live. In other words, these guys are disenfranchised. These are the poor people. How do we treat those people? If you're very pharisaical, and for you, possessions is more important than the person, you will not accept the person, right? Example, look at our church. Somebody comes in the church and doesn't, it's not dressed up properly, long hair. You know, it really look weird. Yeah. You have second thoughts, <laughs> whether you greet the guy and say happy Sabbath, okay? <laughs> but if somebody comes in, oh, he's from England, you know, <laughs> really sophisticated. Oh, everybody started gathering. Oh, that's really cool. Why? What's the tendency of man? To put value more in possessions rather than the person. And you, if, you, if you'd seen the story, right, that, that the children's, during the children's story time, uh, the storyteller grabs a $20 bill, crumples a $20 bill, steps on the $20 bill. Does it matter? No, it remains a $20 bill. It doesn't matter how the $20 bill looks. The value of the $20 bill remains. Pharisees failed to see that. They were looking at the possession that they have at the neglect of the person. So, a first problem in treating an outcast in discipleship is we got to battle somehow our obsession with possessions and things rather than people. How does it go? We start using people to gain things rather than use things. To serve people, okay? Uh, do not use people and love things. Use things and love people, 
Yeah, you've heard that said. How do you treat an outcast if you're a disciple? If you learn through God's help to value the person more than you value possessions, you will have a better chance at treating an outcast the way God expects you to treat the outcast. Okay? Uh, what's the basis of this? We already talked about this. The lost coin and the lost sheep. You know, big deal. If you're looking for the sheep, one writer is saying, who knows, that sheep is probably dead. Is it worth risking the 99? No, because you're so greedy, you don't want to lose that one sheep. Okay? You're so greedy, you don't want to lose that one coin. You want to get that coin. Okay? Because you're more concerned about the coin and the sheep rather than the person. So Jesus interjects the story of the prodigal son. Okay, let's, let's, look, at the, let's look at the second part, which is uh, performance and position. Uh, somebody would be kind enough to read uh, uh, Luke 15, verse 29. So he answered and said to this uh, father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Wow. Well, their son comes back. There was a party because the prodigal son has come back. The father has forgiven the son. They were celebrating. And what did the son say? I have slaved in your household for all these years and you have not given me a single favor. Let's process that. Father, I have performed. I have worked for you. So, I'm going to write this. The story here is the woman taken in adultery. Okay, I'll use another color here so it will help you. This is materialism. Oh no. Is that what I said? Yeah. This is materialism. Uh, performance, this is legalism. What was the problem? What was the problem with all their son? For him, it's more important to do than to be. You follow me? Doing is more important than being. And a lot of people fail you know we, we, we fall into this trap even within our fellowship even within the church even as disciples sometimes we are tempted to concentrate on doing rather than being god is saying you cannot really do un until you first be <laughs> i want to say that again to be is to do or to do is to be <laughs> and then frank sinatra goes dooby dooby do <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> But, but the bottom line is, in terms of the Christian life and discipleship, you cannot do unless you be first. How do I put it? You cannot do good unless you first become a Christian, a recipient of God's grace. That's why I just, I just used to be performance and position. They were more concerned about their performance rather than their position before God. <laughs> what, what were they concerned about? I uh, have no time to discuss this because I don't want to muddy the waters. But uh, don't fail to read Matthew 23. Matthew 23 is about the seven walls. So Matthew 23, Matthew 23 has something to do about the seven walls to the hypocrites or the Pharisees. What's Matthew 5? These are the seven Beatitudes. Okay, that I have no time. I wanted to do this, but seven is too much to handle. So you can just read. There are seven Beatitudes in Matthew 5, but there are seven woes in Matthew 23. 
the seven woes to the Pharisees. The seven woes to the Pharisees basically saying, you hypocrites, remember? God, Jesus called them vipers. In fact, one of the famous analogy that Jesus uses in Matthew 23 is, you are like whitewashed tombs. What, what does that mean? The tomb looks so good outside and it's so white, but inside is a rotting skeleton. That's hypocrisy. You are so good externally. Out in the outside, people admire you, but deep within your heart, you are so rotten morally. And that's the problem. Any legalistic person within the church or within the Christian community is very judgmental. Why is he judgmental? Because you know what he does? Whenever he fails, since he's legalistic, what does he do? He doesn't admit it. What does he do? He looks for somebody to blame, right? <laughs> and that's, what, that's just the tendency. And normally, who do they blame? They blame the outcasts. Let's go to the story. This is the illustration. A woman was dragged to Jesus one day. Because the woman was taken into adultery. And then the people say, according to the book of Moses, what's the punishment? You got to stone her to death. So, what say you, Master Rabbi? How did Jesus respond? He didn't respond. He wrote on the ground. After he wrote on the ground, he said, He who has not committed sin be the first one to cast a stone. What did Jesus write on the ground? Commentators have tried to, tried to figure out and speculate what it was. I think one commentator was close to what it was. I think what Jesus wrote were the sins of those who, was wanting, who were wanting to stone the woman. He started writing their sins. After he wrote the sins, then he told them, Okay, fine. You read what I wrote. I'm sure most of you have committed those. <laughs> you want to stone her? If you have not committed any of the sins, go ahead and stone her. The problem with hypocrites, the problem with legalists, is that they want the external to look good, but they don't care about the internal. How do you accept the outcast then? You cannot uh, accept the outcast because they do not look good on the outside. They only look good if they follow the law externally and perform. That's why true legalists in the church is impossible for them to rejoice when somebody repents. You realize that? That people are People are, even, people are even mad at Jesus. I mean, remember, Jesus could perform the, one of the biggest miracles of all. He raised Lazarus from the dead, right? How did the Pharisees react after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? They plotted to kill him. These this hypocrites and these legalists has no time to rejoice for somebody to repent because they spend their time judging people and dragging people in front of God so they can judge whoever sins. And if you're a legalist, it will be very difficult in your discipleship walk with Jesus to treat the outcasts, particularly those who have sin. Okay, let me take in the plot for our discussion. If you're still with me. I know I'm going to open up a can of worms. We will not spend a whole lot of time here. What do you do with gays in church? Yeah? Sure. Is that the way you're going to treat them then? No, we're just going to take the false side. You cannot go to heaven because you're a feminist. Okay, so is that the way? I mean, if we were, we were done with the lesson, is that our take home? Okay, if somebody comes, if a sinner comes into the church, you just can't go to heaven. Aside from the effeminate, you're, you're like liars, and you know, there's a bunch of those, the group. 
Are you a liar? <laughs> you can't go in. <laughs> we find ourselves reading the writing on the ground <laughs> and we're committing some of those. Okay. So uh, let me be very frank. Because that's a very that's a very hot issue within the Adventist church today. What do you do with gay folks, homosexuals coming into the church? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I like the answer of Cleo. Cleo says, accept them. How, to what extent do we accept them? Okay, you, you can be gay as long as you're celibate, okay? <laughs> Tell you, this is a can of worms, but it's okay. That's one of, one of the most difficult issues is to love a person and separate it from the lifestyle of the person. Um, I will accept, if I were a receptionist, I would welcome them to church. But what do you do when they put their arms around each other while the second service is going on? Cross the line. No, they have to defend and they have to be open for... Uh, so, for, uh, okay, let's, let's follow Adrian's advice. They're sitting in the back and Pastor David Koken is preaching. They put their arms around each other. They go follow Adrian's advice. Hey, you have to repent. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what did God say? Um, here's where wisdom needs to come into play. And I, I'm not even pretending that it's easy. And I'm not only dealing with homosexuals here. I mean... There has been some indiscretions that has been done within the church. You don't drive people away. But in the same token, you don't condone the sin, right? How do I put this? It's, it's very delicate, but I'm going to have to write it anyways. Accept does not necessarily mean condone. Right? Those are two different things. Accepting means I don't care what you did. You're still a person. I still care for you. Unfortunately, if you've been stealing outside, you cannot steal inside this house if I am supposed to accept you and I'll give you shelter in this house. You just don't do that because it's not right. That doesn't mean I do not accept you. Are you following? So we have this blog. We've been talking about the homosexual lifestyle for the past few months. And there has been a lot of openness. Because they, have you heard that there is a film called Seven Gay Adventists? <laughs> it, 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 it has been it, since last year. They've been showing it around. Seven Gay Adventists. How do you deal with gays? And, and a lot, there's some documentation that a lot of gays have committed suicide because they were not accepted in church. And that's very tragic. Okay. Uh, to what extent? So I said, agree. I said, 100%. You got to accept them unconditionally to the church, okay? But the thing is, you draw the line when it goes to condoning. Now, if you tell me, should I accept homosexuals and gays as part of the community? Yes, I should accept the outcasts. They're, they're outcasts in that sense. Although it's, they're no longer outcasts in American society today, they got more rights than. <laughs> And the regular guys, but that's a different story. All I'm saying, if you're an outcast, I'm going to accept you as an outcast, regardless of what sin you've committed. But that's where I draw the line. Although I accept you, I will not condone what you're doing. Do I accept gays? Yes. But the moment gays demand that they should be ordained ministers and that they should marry inside the church, they've crossed the line. Do you get it? Sure, they can, but that's not the lesson study. The lesson is about discipleship. When in the context of the Christian life, we should accept those outcasts, but you do not allow those people 
to continue with their lifestyle. Because that's condoning, that's no longer accepting. And in the long run, that's not really loving. You're just destroying those people. Okay, that's a very, very good question. How long will you accept them? Uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, so we had the friend who was uh, born a man. But the family had all boys. Mother and father said, mommy and daddy said, oh, we want a girl. So as soon as he was born, he said, you will be a girl. Dress him up like a girl, made her act like a girl all her life, or to school like a girl. She dresses up like a girl, you wouldn't know that she's a man. Hey, he's a man, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Because, okay, it's the way he dresses, it's female. Oh, yeah, she, and then especially if she puts a wig on, oh, I mean, she's, she's, she's a very pretty female. So she joins a Bible study group among the Baptists. And the uh, pastors processes this kind of lifestyle in their Bible study. And then when she learned that it's not the right lifestyle to take, and if you're in Jesus, you can have the power to change you. She went ahead, did this thing. It occurred, you know. She never changed the way she dressed. I'm sorry, the way he dressed, <laughs> okay. Um, and finally, the pastor couldn't take it anymore. The pastor said, you know, the next time I see you wear a bra during a Bible study, you cannot attend the Bible study anymore. She did wear a bra during the, sec the next time they had the Bible study. And, she, and he was no longer counted as part of the Bible study group. What do you think of the pastor's action? Get it? So two was it? That's so you go to the last part, the last part of the story. When all the people left, the woman looks at Jesus, looks up, and Jesus asks, "Where are all those who condemn you?" And the woman said. Master, they're gone. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. What are the next words? Go and sin no more. How do you deal with sinful outcasts? It's a very challenging question. You got to give them unconditional acceptance. Yes, you got to give them unconditional acceptance. But you got to draw the line where acceptance crosses condoning. Jesus will always accept you, but he will not condone what you did. In fact, if you look at the parable of the prodigal son, although Jesus said the son was accepted when he went back to the father, Jesus was very careful not to downplay the effects of sin. Because the most detestful thing that a Jew can ever do is to take care of pigs, let alone eat with pigs. That's the lowest you can be as a Jew. And what happened? He went down to the point where he wanted to eat with the pigs because what? He sinned. What was Jesus trying to say? You mess up with the law. You disobey God. You will mess up your life. It's going to be so ugly for you. Does that mean you cannot come back to me? You can come back to me and I will accept you. But all that Jesus is saying, the moment you come back to me, I will not condemn you. But go. Don't mess your life anymore. Easier said than done. Right? Because the moment you go to our church and you see situations like that, you can accept those people unconditionally. But to come back and tell them, go and sin no more, that's more difficult to say. But that's what the Bible enjoins us to do. Accept. Make sure do not condone. How do you call sin by its right name tactfully? How do you call sin by its right name gracefully? That's a growth area we need to pray to God about. Got to accept the outcasts in the church, but at the same token, be frank enough to tell them that what they're doing is wrong. And you need wisdom from God to be able to do that. Okay? What are we just trying to do? We're saying it's not the performance that really counts. 
It's your position. In other words, it's not so much the external that counts. What God's after is your heart. Because I can get that person who joined the Bible study and take away her female, his female clothing and dress him up like a man so that he looks externally like a man, but if in his heart he still wants to be a woman, he still has problems. Somebody who deals with the outcast will be more concerned with the heart, the position of the person before God, and how God should change the heart rather than just the external or the performance of the individual. Okay? I'll leave it at that because this will not end, I know, because that's a very hot potato. But that's one of the biggest, I'll just give you an illustration. There is an illustration that there was, there was a Christian who owned uh, an apartment building. He was renting out the units to the people who were going to live in the apartments. And there was a gay couple who wanted to rent out the unit in the apartment. And the Christian couple said, I'm sorry, we cannot rent out the apartment to you because it's against our conviction. You know why, right? You going to live together there in my apartment. I just, just against my values. That was taken to court. If that's not enough, there was a cake maker. Right? You've heard about the cake maker? When he, when he bakes cakes, he bakes cakes, he specializes in baking wedding cakes. And the, the reason why he's very successful in the very, you know, very special wedding cakes is before he bakes the wedding cakes, he tries to get to know the couple who's going to get married so that he can pour the lives and the personalities of the couple into the cake. He's gonna, so he's part of the wedding, he's part of the marriage because it's a sacred ceremony. And everybody loved this guy. Everybody went to him to have the wedding cake because it's part of the wedding. He's part of the wedding. The wedding cake is even part of the marriage until a gay couple approached him. And he said, I remember his interview with John and Parshall. And he said, I'm sorry, I cannot bake the cake for your wedding because I cannot participate in your wedding. I do not believe that you should be married. I was taken to court too. That's, I think, an example where somebody took a stand who was loving to accept people, but at the same token, did not want to give up biblical principles to the glory of God. God help us when that happens, and I'm telling you, it will happen. There are some outcasts in church that might hit us one of these days, and I hope we'll be accepting, but in the same token, I hope we'll not be condoning. Where do you do the balance? That's why it's a discipleship growth. It's a maturity process. You have to pray to God, allow you to accept but not condone in that perspective, okay? That's the third story about, the third story is about the Samar Samaritan woman. In John 4. Okay, what's the problem with the Samaritan woman? Okay, I call it elitism, but in this particular case, you can call it racism. Oh yeah, you get several points against her. Why did the Jews hate the Samaritans? Because Israel joined with the enemy, mm -hmm. and the enemy called, inhabited, or you know, married mm -hmm. the women, mm -hmm. threw out all the guys, and so the women had uh, yeah. family of mixed. Uh, yeah. So you know, you know how we, we studied this before, right? In the Minor Prophets, the divided Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, and the, the Northern Kingdom was called Samaria, and uh, Assyria invaded Samaria, and they were captivated. They were taken captive uh, earlier than the Southern Kingdom was taken by Babylon, but Assyria took captive of uh, Samaria, and like uh, Benji was saying, they got rid of all the males. They left the woman, and there was an intermarriage, and there were there was a whole well, there were generations born, a combination of some of Assyrians and Jews, and since you get Assyrians and Jews intermarrying, their kids were called Samaritans, and when you say Samaritan, it's nothing more than a mixture of a pagan blood with the blood of supposedly part of the chosen people of God. 
So it's a contaminated race, basically. Since you're a contaminated race, I will not accept you. Okay, <laughs> these are so, these wide-ranging applications, because we're talking about racism here, okay? Uh, we'll go to here in a little while. Um, why, why, why is it uh, long-ranging? Because like Benji is saying, how does a, a, a Jew treat a Samaritan? They treat them as dogs. Why? or progeny born from his uh, usual mate and his sons. So, you know, the, the morals of the dog is like that. Okay, well, they're, 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 impli they're, they're, they're implications of the reproductive process in the, of animals. Yeah. But they're basically saying, I'm not treating you like a person anymore. I'm treating you like an animal. That's how bad it was. And the Samar Samaritans who were the outcast treated, were treated by the Jews like that. In fact, one of the, the commentaries of the Jewish literature says that if a Jew sees a Samaritan giving birth on the road, right? A woman, Samaritan, who's giving birth on the road, he's supposed to leave the woman alone, even if the woman needs help very badly. She's bleeding, water bag breaks. You leave her alone, lest another Samaritan be born into this world. That's how bad they treated each other. It, it, does that happen today? Yeah. Is racism still rampant? Yeah, in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, in the Middle East, does it happen in America? I thought it never happened. My first couple years here in America, I was assigned to be the communications secretary of the church. So I ended up writing articles for, you know, for the publications of our church. So I think I thought there was an anniversary in the church. I wrote an article on the anniversary. I put the pictures in there, you know, used the computers to make it camera ready and all. I submitted it to the conference. The article was never printed. But I had... Uh, I had a copy of the email <laughs> I sent and the copy of what I gave to them so they can print it. Uh, I wrote the communications department, did not respond to me. So I ended up writing the president and asked because we invited some people, the former presidents, the conference presidents before to visit, you know, and I have promised those guys there'll be an article. <laughs> it's embarrassing that this uh, administrators looking for an article, they can't find it. So the president wrote me back, oh, I'm sorry we were not able to print it. Long story short, the guy in charge of printing the article didn't like non-Americans. Because I was a Filipino, uh, the article was not worth printing. I thought I double-checked the grammar. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I took some journalism class and I thought it was a good article, this is a news article. In fact, the president read the article and said it's a good, it was a good read. Uh, the husband of the lady in charge who rejected my article was a close friend of mine. It's one of the, got to work with him, so whenever he sees me from afar, he already waves and shakes my hands. So one day I saw the couple walking one Sabbath, and the husband again extended his hand, shook their hands together. A wife went directly past me as if I wasn't there. I don't know if she was embarrassed. It, uh, she detested my presence because I had a different blood. So, you know. For the first time, I tasted how our African American brothers feel, the way they're treated. Well, how was expecting to be in heaven? I don't know. I, I don't know. I didn't worry about that anymore. <laughs> I said, I, if I remember right, I think they eventually, no, it never got printed. 
I thought they printed it because the president wanted to print it, but the president did not. Uh, and guess what? It was the president who apologized to me, <laughs> not the lady. Well, I, but you, you, you see, do you see how ugly racism is? Uh, and it happens in church, among the people of God. You should don't love that particular race. You can discriminate that race, and it's an outcast. You cannot, you don't accept them anymore. What stuff? That's why this is one of the key maturation processes of a disciple. Can you accept somebody, not your own kind? So what did they say? Pharisees love presents instead of the presenter. Uh, I say they love the gifts. They do not love the giver. I only say that because towards the end of the confrontation or not the, con the talk with the Samaritan woman, this, the end of the story was about worship, right? What is the worship? Uh, well, your, your, father's, your father's worship in this mountain, Mount Gerizim, right? And you worship in Jerusalem. I tell you, the time is coming that he who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. The bottom line is we have institutionalized salvation. We have institutionalized salvation. Uh, uh, we have institutionalized uh, religion. And what happens? Unless there is an edifice, unless there is something tangible that God has given, it's not there. We're more interested with the institution, with the organization, with the race, with whatever we see, rather than the God of the race and the God of the church and the God of the denomination. So it's, it, it goes past beyond racism and elitism. But why, why do I say that? So many times when we pray, what do you expect? You don't expect, you expect something to be given to you by God, right? Nobody even prays now naturally to say, God give us more of you. You know what I'm trying to say? That's a very different prayer from give me this, God, give me that. Instead of saying give me this, give me that, you say, Lord, we want more of you. Because you love more of what God gives you and the things that you can have rather than himself. The reason why we have racism, the reason why we have elitism, the reason why we cannot accept a lot of outcasts is we value more of what we get from God rather than, than value God himself who says there is no Jew or Gentile male or female, slave or free. That's because the presenter is gone. We look for the presence. Three stories. Three contrasts. Saying if you just concentrate on these three, when you discuss this with your folks, it'd be a lot easier to remember what it means to mature. What does it mean to mature? in dealing with the outcast. You want to make sure that you value people more than you value possessions. You want to make sure that you value your position in Jesus. You value your being in Jesus rather than your performance or your doing in Him. And then you value the giver, the presenter, instead of the presence, instead of the gifts. You do that, you'll have a clearer picture of who the outcasts are. And you'll have a more, a ten, more tender hearts towards the outcasts than the people over here. These are the guys who outrightly rejects the outcasts. And these are the guys who concentrates on this, who God can mold to be true acceptors of the outcasts in our society. Um, I love that story uh, about the kind of a mainline Texas church. It was a relatively large church, you know, where people go in with three-piece suits, you know. This is like a church with conservative but really way up there, very sophisticated church. So you don't go to church unless you're in a suit, you're properly dressed, preferably three-piece. You go in there. One day, while they were having church, there was a biker that came in. <laughs> you know, a biker looks, right? Leather, blue jeans, boots. 
And then he sat in the back. <laughs> Long hair. Tattoos. A whole nine yards. And you know, all of a sudden, you hear this buzz in the congregation. It does not happen before. Everybody's so uncomfortable. Okay? So as if that wasn't uh, uh, touchy enough, this biker stands up. And he walks towards the front. Because <laughs> the sermon was about to start. And you know what he does? He sits on the floor <laughs> to listen to the sermon. You can imagine what's going on in this very sophisticated church. <laughs> you, know, you got three-piece suits, you know. We're all being ready for like a tuxedo party. And then one, finally, one deacon, an elderly deacon, muster the carriage to walk from the door all the way to the front. <laughs> okay. And everybody's like <laughs> trying to gasp for breath. I mean, you know, they're watching what's going to happen. It's watching this elderly deacon approaching this man. You know. How will he bounce him? <laughs> he's, not, he's not like a bouncer that's going to go out. He goes in there. And guess what happened? As soon as he gets to the front, that elderly deacon sits down with that biker, and they listened to the sermon together. The pastor said at that moment, you know you may forget my sermon today, but what this brother did, you will never forget. That's discipleship and the outcast. That's Jesus. When you look at Jesus in the gospel, where do you see Jesus? He's with the outcast. Uh, it's so sad that sometimes we measure holiness by the distance we maintain away from the sinners. Right? Do you get me? You think that you're holier. If you're, the farther away you are from sinners, the holier you are. And because of that misconception, we don't take time to approach the outcast. One example at work, I normally stay late at work because if I do not go to work before 8 o'clock, parking will be so difficult, I want to find a parking spot. So what I do, I go to work after 11 because 11, everybody goes out to lunch and there will be a parking free space. So I go to 11, most of the time I stay late for work. And you know what happens at night at about 6, 7 o'clock, all the cleaning crew comes in, right? Um, Every time somebody comes to me and gets my trash can and throws it in the big, uh, you know, the big uh, container, I, I give the trash can to the lady or to the man and I said, uh, thank you. One night, the manager of all the cleaning crew, he's Greek, he was having a tough time. Every time he sees me, he goes like this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he salutes me. I don't know why he salutes me. He was smoking when, when, I, when I saw him. And I said, uh, why are you limping? Oh, because uh, I have a problem with my knee. Doctor says, need surgery. Okay. But I have to wait. You know, not, not enough strength. Then I told him, brother, you think this is helping you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's my friend, okay? Oh, I understand. Yeah, you, man, you, you want to have surgery? You got to get ready. You got to get rid of this, man. It should be better for you. This is where you'd be ready. Oh, yeah. You know, it's hard. And he said, Brother, look. He gives you the strength to do that. You know what? He, I, I see him every other day. You know, some, sometimes during the week, because I come in early sometimes, but I come in late. I see him at night. <laughs> Whenever I see him. <laughs> <laughs> he does this. Now, if I were just a regular guy working in an office, give me a break. Why will I take time to even greet these cleaners? I'm way above their pay grade. <laughs> you say that. No. I'm the outcast. I don't want to forget this because I want to tell this. That I, was, I reserve this too. You know Ray, right? Ray Tuazan works in the hospital, and he tells his story. I cannot forget. 
there's a policy in the hospital, I don't know if it's still there, that you got to sanitize your hands when you go approach a patient. You either, you either wash your hands or you put a sanitizer. If, even if you put gloves, you got to have a sanitizer. So one night, the head nurse went into the room to examine the patient while the cleaning lady was there. She did not sanitize her hands, did not wash it or sanitize it either, and was proceeding to touch the patient. And the cleaning lady said, Ma'am, you need to wash or sanitize your hands before you approach the patient. She got upset. She was the supervisor of the nurses and the shift. You know, who are you to tell me that? You know, I mean, who are you? You're just a cleaning lady. And then she said, ma'am, my mother died just recently because a nurse did not sanitize her hands. I don't want the same thing to happen to this patient. That's what happens when you value possessions and things more than when you value people, right? Oh, how you will never lose anything. I'm telling you, you will never lose anything if you accept and recognize people of every shape or color. The Pharisees think that they will lose their dignity if they touch one of the outcasts and greet them. But Jesus says, no. You have been a recipient of God's grace. Give that grace to other people, particularly the outcast. And you will know what it means to be my disciple. Very simple approach. But man, I'm telling you right now, one of the most difficult areas to grow in, in your discipleship, is to what? Accept the outcast. And at the same time, don't cross the line of condoning what the outcast is doing. All right? Any questions? So we don't have people to ask. Oh. Yes, that's a very good question. Elitism, racism was started by God. Hello. Anyone wants to react to that? Did God start elitism? Yeah, because he sets Israel separate from the yeah. other people. Uh, he, set, he put Israel for, him, for himself. Yeah, Richard Dawkins claims that, I think in the book God Delusion, that uh, the command to love your neighbor as yourself in the Old Testament was a command to love another Jew not to love all people, to love another Jew. But when you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament talks about strangers. You take strangers in, right? Again and again, you, even in the rule of the Sabbath. Uh, thou shalt not do any work, no, thou nor the son or the daughter, nor the stranger within your gates. Be hospitable, that's part of Eastern culture. And then when God went to Abraham, Abraham said, in you shall the Israelite nation be blessed. What was the promise? In you shall all nations be blessed. The original plan of God is to use the children of Israel to be an instrument of blessing to all peoples. But that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ was a blessing to all peoples of the world. Yes, but the original plan of God was not just for Israel to be his parochial people. The original plan of God was for the people, his people to be a blessing to other nations. It was not God's failure. It was Israel's failure. Yeah, but they did. They were taken into captivity so many times. They were not. They, they were. They went into idolatry, and if they did not go into idolatry, worship the true God, you know, a God who can part the sea, who God, a God who can destroy walls, impenetrable walls, a God so powerful that even the the 
the powerful monarchs of empires during their time will bow down to their gods. Did Daniel prove that? Yes, he did. Did Joseph prove that? Yes, they did. But the people of God themselves thought they had the monopoly of God. And that was a problem. That was the, the, the design of God. The design of God was the father of the Israelite nation was to be an instrument of blessing through all nations. Okay. So, but the, I think that your concern is legit. It's a legitimate question. The question is, what do you say that there's a command in, in the Bible to be separate, right? Come out of her, my people, so you won't be part of her plagues. What does that mean to be peculiar and to be different? Okay, and that's the point. He said, one writer said, if he, I think it is John Stott who said, if the world does not see a difference between a Christian and a pagan, we will be an embarrassment to the church. There must be a difference between a pagan and a Christian. Right? So, how does, it, how does that affect our acceptance of the outcast? If you want to be peculiar, Benji already answered the question. You do not reject the race, right? You do not reject the person. You reject the practice. Peculiarity is in what you do. It's not so much the essence or nature of the person. Because all of us are sinners and all of us are entitled, not entitled, all of us were given God's grace. And I'm saying, does God's grace know any limits to color and race? No. It can save... God's grace can save anybody. So what is the call to peculiarity? The call to peculiarity is to stand on the principles of God. But that doesn't mean you will discriminate and not accept some of the outcasts. Remember the proclamation of God's word. Jesus is both exclusive and inclusive, right? Why is Jesus exclusive? Because there's no other way. Only Jesus can save you. That's what the Bible says. No one comes to the Father but by me. But how inclusive is Jesus? I am the only way. But when you accept me, whoever accepts me, respect regardless of your race, regardless of your position in society, you can have eternal life. So the exclusivity and the inclusivity of Christ is there. I mean, I think that can guide us into peculiarity, the call to peculiarity. The call to peculiarity is we have an exclusive claim that Jesus alone can save. But in the same token... Whoever follows Jesus, regardless of who you are, you can be saved. Okay? Your peculiarity is not for you to distance yourself from the sinner. Your peculiarity is to behave differently from the sinner. Not so much look differently from the sinner. Okay? That doesn't mean God doesn't affect the way you dress. Okay? That's another kind of word. But all I'm trying to say it is how the... If, let me repeat what, uh, what Bethke said. If you believe that you're saved by grace through faith, then show it, right? If you're saved by grace and you've been a recipient of God's grace, can I see that grace in your life? That's just the question. That's basically what we're trying to say. If God's grace has saved you, then show me that grace in the way you treat outcast, And maybe the world will believe that you're a disciple who has been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So there's still a balance. The balance to be peculiar doesn't mean to reject the outcast. But actually to behave differently from the outcast and still show acceptance for the outcast and show them the way through Jesus Christ to make a difference in their lives. All right? Okay, let's close with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time this afternoon. We have dealt with one of the more difficult areas of discipleship. Although to a certain extent, because we've been saved by grace, it's easy to accept anyone. But when it comes to the line of what needs to be condoned and where we call sin by its right name without hurting the other individual, that, that it's not that easy. We pray that you will give us wisdom as we grow as disciples of yours. Not to compromise the truth, but stand for the truth though the heavens fall. And yet at the same time be gracious and loving to accept anyone regardless of their status, regardless of their race, regardless of their circumstances, for the sake of the glory of the cross. And in so doing, learn more of how powerful the blood of Jesus is, who can save to the uttermost anyone who believes in him. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.